So he huffed and he puffed, but the big bad wolf couldn't blow the house down this time since the third little pig had built his house out of bricks. And they all lived happily ever after. Happily ever after. What a crock. Who, who said that? I did. Who are you? I'm the nest egg. The what? The nest egg. I belong to your parents. I'm their retirement. Well, you're pretty big for an egg. Actually, I'm pretty small for a nest egg. About 60% smaller than I should be by now. And that's what I want to talk to you about. I want you to hear the rest of the story. What story? The three little pigs. It's over. They lived happily ever after. Ah, uh, don't drink that Kool-Aid, kid. You need to wise up. Happily ever after isn't what it used to be. Retirement is no fairy tale. Yes! Mom! It's another kind of story all together. Who's feeling young now? Why don't we just sit here and do nothing? Be thrilled. I think that's a great idea. Retirement. For several generations now, it has been the fairy tale ending to the American dream. We've grown up with the promise that if we work hard and plan properly, we will live out our golden years enjoying the fruits of our labors. And the people you're about to meet, like a growing number of Americans, are waking up from that dream, only to discover that promised ending is beyond their grasp. Who's feeling young now? In the industrious American journey from cradle to grave, the hope of a secure and comfortable final act appears to many of us to be dying. In honor of different composers, I have little things that I do. Like I always wear fishnet hose for Rachmaninoff. And I always wear super red lipstick for Mahler, but I don't get to wear this tonight. Now I just have to let my hair do its thing. Jean Jobert's pursuit of the American dream has taken her to New Orleans, where she plays cello with the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra. But at the age of 42, the years of grueling practice have taken their toll. Just on an everyday basis, if I'm playing a lot, there is a lot of um, wear and tear on the body just because it's, I mean, the cello's big. Five years or so into my time here, it came about that I required back surgery. Um, the disc between my sixth and seventh vertebrae <laughs> shot. <laughs> Just one day before a major concert, Jean's neck has gone out of tune. Uh, I don't know, something's going on in my back. There's this tension back there. And as a result, I'm getting all this twitching and little spasms throughout my arm and also a kind of feeling of weakness, which is very disconcerting because this is a big part of my job. <laughs> Nobody wants to be forced to keep doing something past their prime. And, you know, we're not robots. We're deteriorating every day, you organic beings. I feel like I sound great now. I hope I'll sound great till I'm 80, <laughs> but usually you don't. So there should be an expiration date and we'll just see when that comes. And I hope that I'm able to retire prior to that expiration date. <laughs> Here it is, the monster. 
But will her budget be in line with her hopes to retire before her body says it's too late? Okay, 20 years from now, I will be 62. There it is, that's 2033. I will be, as a human being, according to this, I'm hoping there's something wrong with it, $32,184 in debt. I'm off to a good An auspicious start. Uh-oh. I never thought that Bob and I in our golden years would be where we are now. This is a tough one. At 64, an age when many Americans are ready to retire, Julia Beardsley's husband, Bob, finds himself struggling to get back in the game. Sixer? Like 76er. Oh, I don't think that's a word. I tried. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Out of work for almost a year, the executive consultant and self-described corporate gypsy needs to find a job. In eight years, I moved jobs three times because the company laid off people. That's the easiest way to say it. And I'm out there again. I just didn't realize it was due again. We had a sizable amount put away for our retirement. Everything all in order. We did what we thought was the right thing. Next month, we'll see. We're living month to month now. Yeah. We had yeah. several bouts of unemployment um, that just cut into our savings and then into our retirement, and that's how we're surviving right now. What is that? It's my phone. Oh. Something has got to come up. It's got to change, or I'll be that little old bag lady on the corner <laughs> begging money from you. <laughs> oh, we got a problem, honey. What? But the reality is no laughing matter. Bob has six short months to find work, or they really may be packing their bags. When it comes to having to move, it's exhausting. The end game is if I don't have something by the end of the summer, we're going to have to look at something serious. I think about where two old people will end up. <laughs> no. Just being able to, to live without working, you know, without having an income, like how do you do that? Oh, hey, Nick, it's Debbie. I wanted to ask you about uh, Naturalon. If you know who can really, at our age, retire when they're 65 or, I mean, it just seems like you'd have to keep working. I guess I just worry more about us getting by, you know, just in the short term. 41-year-old Debbie Kinkella and her husband, Aaron, both knew from the moment they married in 2008. Here you go, Daddy. Thank you that they wanted to start a family, and fast. <laughs> we were excited because we had been trying for a little while, and um, I was just glad that, you know, that part of my life was finally going to happen, because I would kind of thought maybe it wasn't. When Debbie learned that she was pregnant, it seemed like all the pieces of a picture-perfect life were coming together. But Cece's birth also brought with it a few pieces that didn't fit. It was almost like a dream, you know, when the cardiologist was drawing a picture of a normal heart and then showing us a picture of Cece's heart, and there were all these pieces that were missing. And I just kept looking at it thinking, is this for real? With a congenital heart defect, Cece, now three, will likely be having heart surgeries for years to come. The question was, you know, really, what kind of quality of life can my daughter have with, with, this, with this defect? This is my back jail here. People like to think that life is priceless. You, most people don't realize this, but there's a lifetime maximum written into the policy, and we had to take that into account. <laughs> it's tough. 
so. Oh, oh, I'm stuck. <laughs> I'm stuck there. Add to that a family health insurance plan with a price tag in excess of $1,000 a month, a cost that makes saving enough for retirement out of reach. It's almost as much as we're paying in a mortgage payment every month just to have health insurance. Um, but we also know we can never let her lapse in coverage. We haven't really been able to save a significant amount of money in the last three years. We build it the right way, it won't fall over. So it's kind of scary, you know, like what is going to happen <laughs> to us? If we're in the same position we're in right now, it's not going to be very good. Good job. Good job. Are you making our house? <laughs> We're going this way? I mean, they said they're running 15 minutes behind. Hey, ladies, how you doing? Hi. Good to see you. That's the guy. 24-year-old Nick Troiano and his colleague, Ryan Shinicky, are crusaders on behalf of their entire generation. We're feeling pretty confident. Yeah. They're here on Capitol Hill to make sure they have a voice in a conversation they believe has to happen. I think retirement in the future on our current path is gonna be pretty awful for my generation in terms of the programs that'll uh, be there for us. I'm actually nervous now. Okay, we still have five minutes. The two are just minutes away from a meeting with one of DC's biggest players in budget brokering. Yeah, I don't think we even wanna like spend a lot of time going over who we are. I mean, he's gonna be- Everything's gonna be forgotten except the stuff that we- Is that Bernie Sanders? Yeah, yeah, it's Bernie Sanders. We should have asked him to talk about the death. He doesn't like us. No, he doesn't. No. Well, this is our humble abode. Nick and Ryan are leaders of the Can Kicks Back, a youth-driven, nonpartisan campaign aimed at raising awareness of an impending debt crisis that they fear will fall unfairly on their generation's shoulders. It's a moral issue. If the ultimate test of a moral society is the world we leave our children, our grandchildren, this country's failing and failing miserably at it. No matter what the solution is, it's better than doing nothing because we know what happens if we do nothing. And that's the fact that the American dream for my generation will not be there. Hey guys, nice to meet you. Congressman Nick Triana. Nick Triana. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Honey, what is it? Uh, the egg. What egg, sweetheart? What are you talking about? The egg was here. He said retirement wasn't a fairy tale. He was scary. Oh, honey, you had a bad dream, that's all. And you are much too young to be worrying about retirement, my goodness. But he said he was your nest egg and that he was too small. It wasn't a dream, Mommy. Maybe he's under the bed. Sweetheart, there is nothing under the bed. Eggs don't talk, and they certainly don't talk to little boys about retirement. It was just a dream. Is your nest egg too small? Is it too small? My goodness, what a question. Your father and I have plenty of time before we retire. We're going to be just fine. Now you go to sleep and stop worrying about such nonsense. Talk about the Nile. She was looking right at me. No, no, I have to get rid of all the old food under there. Oh my gosh. Nikki, this is old. Things are growing in here, Nick. Uh, he's got too much stuff. Oh, Nicky. <laughs> uh, the wow. I made I made food. Okay. Another load. Are you for real? I said I think I need like a, a couple rolls of paper towels. That's all I said. Oh my god. Oh my god is right. Three generations of Nick Troiano's family are stocking up, cleaning up, and catching up in his 514 square foot apartment just outside of Washington, D.C. Graham, how's work going? Oh, lovely. Don't ask. My back, <laughs> my poor back. Since you have no shirts anymore, my friend, <laughs> my son. <laughs> Thank All right? you. A full-time activist, Nick is also a part-time graduate student in American government at Georgetown University. Nicholas. Yes? Do you need any batteries? But even the best and brightest can use a little help now and then. For daddy, put that on your bike. 
<laughs> Come on, yeah. <laughs> Come on, yeah, before you get squashed. Like Nick's dad, Lou, a 52-year-old salesman for a paper recycling company, has happily shouldered his son's $150,000 college debt for the time being. Still years away from retirement, the proud father says he isn't worried about the future yet. My retirement plan right now it's called a life insurance policy. No, I can not. Uh, no, my retirement plan right now is Social Security 100%. Well, I shouldn't say 100%, 98%. I have a 401k with uh, not enough in it, but I have a 401k. And uh, I can hear my wife in my ear right now. What are we doing about that? It's plan B. Uh, you know, I don't worry about these things until it's time to worry about it. <laughs> Just, yeah. <laughs> that's inside out, so, and that matches that. It scares me to even think of that. Because I, I honestly feel like I talk about it with my husband all the time about retirement. It's something very scary that I'm afraid to even think about retirement. I don't think there'll ever be a retirement. I don't. Mm. You know, I worry about that. Like, I see what my mom is doing at 72 years old. This is for you, Grandpa. Oh, thanks, Graham. I never thought I would be working at this age. Never. Where's your bedroom? For Nick's grandmother, Mary Ann, working means a part-time minimum wage job doing clerical work to supplement the Social Security check that just isn't enough. We will receive every month twelve forty-two eighty after deductions. That's what I'm living off of. That pays my rent, my bills. Not all of them, that's why I'm working. And my little pension, but there's no money left over at the end of the month. When they're hungry, they're yeah. hungry. With both his parents and his grandmother so reliant on Social Security. Okay. Cheers, here's to the debt. <laughs> <laughs> the debt that we're all here's in. Here's Social Security. <laughs> bon appetit. Nick okay. questions whether that retirement plan is really a plan at all. I'm not sure my dad has a retirement plan. He has retirement hopes and desires. I think his mentality is you work hard and do the right thing and things work out. This one doesn't work. Stop it. And you do what you need to do right now to make sure your family has what it needs and you're setting up your kids for a successful life. Here you go, broken right. lamp fixed. And you'll figure out the rest later. It's all social security, so Nick better save it for me. That's his task. Right now, it's worth as much as the paper it's printed on. And it's a task that Nick has passionately assumed, knowing that in less than 20 years, Social Security will be in serious trouble. I found my Social Security statement online now, and they put a little interesting disclaimer on it. And it said, uh, without changes in 2033, Social Security will be able to pay only 77 cents for each dollar of scheduled benefits. And that's for everybody, not just Nick's generation. Uh, that means if we wait until 20 years from now without changing anything about the program, my check is gonna be 23% less. So that's why I think we need to do something about it that protects you, but also does something so my generation can have some retirement security too. You have to change it, Nick. Right. You have my permission, change it. <laughs> but Nick knows he needs more than grandma's permission. Sold from Brittany's house. He needs to get the attention of policymakers. Which brings us back to Capitol Hill. Hi, Nick Triana. Nick Triana. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Where are you guys from? And that big meeting Nick was waiting for. It's time for the can to kick back. Yeah. Uh, Washington's yeah, taking it down too long. So our nonpartisan effort is trying to organize young people locally in mm -hmm. high schools, college campuses, young professional communities to put some greater pressure on Congress and the White House to achieve a generationally balanced deficit reduction agreement. Yeah, it's, I mean, look, you know where the trajectory is going. You know your generation. Uh, I'm X generation. You guys, what do you call yourselves? Y or millennials? Millennials. You're millennials. Yeah, yeah sorry. You got a beard. I figured I'd just try to figure out. But um, uh, you know, we know without a shred of doubt that you're going to get a lower standard of living. We know that. The government's making all these promises to you that we know it can't keep.
Social Security was enacted in the throes of the Great Depression. Young people have come to wonder what would be their lot when they came to old age. We started to think about retirement as a legitimate life course right around the Social Security passage. So it's a recent expectation for the past 60 years. Very wealthy and privileged workers always expected that they would have time at the end of their working lives. This social security measure gives at least some protection. It promised some degree of retirement security to America's lower income elderly. Before Social Security, we had a great deal of division between who got to have a time of dignity and who did not. So people without resources had to work and scrape by and died during that activity. Or if they were lucky enough to work in their 60s and 70s, they died on the job. So was Social Security ever intended to be a standalone retirement plan? Retirement should be a three-legged stool. There should be some personal savings, a pension, and the guarantee of Social Security. The way Social Security functions in our system is as a kind of backstop to prevent people from falling into poverty in old age. It's obviously supposed to be the first leg of the stool, not the whole stool. It means everything to me, because without it, I wouldn't be able to survive. For many Americans, the Social Security leg has taken on an outsized role for which it was never intended. Oh. Unfortunately, a lot of people haven't saved on their own. So there uh, is a huge fraction of the elderly who are wholly dependent on Social Security or mostly dependent on Social Security. We can't rely on the government to provide the sole source of retirement income. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're changing that three-legged stool into a pogo stick. And even as more Americans become over-reliant on that single leg, some economists, like Lawrence Kotlikoff, say problems in the very structure of Social Security are bringing us to the brink of a crisis. Social Security is bankrupt. Social Security got going without anybody thinking about who's gonna pay the bills when they started making these promises. We're not measuring what we're doing to our kids. We're not talking about who's gonna pay for different generations benefits. That's the design flaw that underlies Social Security. Not everyone sees Social Security's design as flawed. We needed to build a floor or a foundation. That is the genius of Social Security. We all pull the wagon in our youth because we might have to sit in the wagon in our latter years. But are there enough people to pull a wagon weighed down with a growing number of retirees? Social Security is supposed to be a generational pact and a promise to the next generation, but it's turning out to be an unsustainable pyramid scheme. The program of Social Security relies on current workers being able to pay for current retirees. But what's happening as we move forward is that there are a lot more retirees and a lot less workers. This is Nikki, fix the debt. <laughs> I feel sorry for the kids, like Nikki's generation, for sure. What's it going to be for them is what I want to know. It scares me. That scares me also because I don't, I don't think that there will be Social Security. So I don't know what I'm going to be dependent on. I, I sure hope I'm not dependent on my kids. That's what I tell my husband. I just hope that we can be able to take care of ourselves and don't burden the kids. It's going to take some sort of crisis. It's going to take a lot of people living longer without enough savings facing extreme hardship for us to begin to really start having these conversations. Mm. Yes. No pressure. Oh. Hey, Liam, I want to see your teeth. <gasps> Look at that smile. It worries me so much because the state our country's in. Put it on. I don't know what my children and grandchildren will do. 
Oh, is that cute? Uh oh, another one another coming. Another one loose. Oh, I need to pull that out. So, where were we? You're not here. You're just a bad dream, like my mom said. What I am is a real live nightmare that your mom and dad and a whole lot of other people are going to have to wake up to in the not so distant future. Just like the three pigs. They lived happily ever after. Says you. Says my mom. She was missing some pages. We can skip a few decades here. Um, yada, yada, yada. And the first two pigs learned a valuable lesson from their brother and had built houses of brick for themselves. Pigs are smart. I read that. Indeed. And as they oinked on into their golden years, they began to think about how they would spend them. The first little pig, who had recently begun collecting social security, was looking at retirement communities in Florida. The second pig, who would soon be collecting his city pension, dreamed of spending his days fishing. The third pig, who had contributed to a 401k for years, planned on touring the enchanted forest in an RV. My grandparents have an RV. Bet your granddad has a pension. No, it's a Winnebago. No, I I'm talking about a... Eh, never mind. Let's get back to our story. It sounds like they were going to live happily ever after. You'd think. But our confident little pigs were in for quite a shock when they discovered they weren't living in a fairy tale after all. What? I don't think I like this story. You and me both, kid. What? <gasps> So I gotta get these wrapped. Get ready for the party tomorrow. Geritol. I didn't even think I'd be able to find it. Tabasco green. I've heard as you get older, you lose your sense of taste. And so you keep spicing your food more and more and more. And they're going to get a real chuckle out of this. Depends <laughs> for men. How about 59? How about not? Here. How about 56? I don't like 95. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Bob. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Are you 20? Are you 30? And many more. Bob Beardsley's 65th birthday sounds like it's all laughs. <laughs> this is not nice, guys. <laughs> He's doing his best to put on a happy birthday face for the grandkids and their parents in from New Jersey. What is this? Oh, no. Oh, no. oh. I'm officially yeah, the old. Only thing oh, is are you kidding? <laughs> At 65, Bob might be expected to retire like many of his fellow baby boomers, but he's not. Okay, let me try it. I now have to build this sucker, so that's my next job. Four months into his self-imposed deadline to find work or move, he's still looking for a job. Now I've interviewed six times, and I'm not being further considered. I didn't get very far in the interview process. Yeah, all right, I can do it, okay. I can work this. Birthdays are increasingly becoming a gateway to be at risk of being poor or actually near poor. Aging in America is clearly becoming more risky. Economist Teresa Ghilarducci has studied the retirement prospects of future retirees, and her conclusions are startling. You guys are bad. We found that half of middle class older workers now will expect to have less than $5 a day for food in retirement. I'm afraid to open anything else. Then as they age in retirement, it's going to be more and more difficult for that former middle class retiree not to live in poverty, which means a chronic state of want. I'll miss it. While a life of poverty may seem unthinkable for Julia and Bob, the story of Bob's parents makes the prospect of a lower standard of living very real. My parents both worked for aerospace and they were both laid off. They ended up in a mobile home with uh, their two social security checks and a small bit of retirement. 
I see that some of my savings is going away and I don't want to end up in a trailer in Alpine, California. Oh, yeah. Alpine's okay. Trailer not. <laughs> the house has lost, on paper, uh, almost half of its value. We couldn't afford to sell it today. We'll have to wait a few years and then we're, hopefully it'll come back. Their house in the San Francisco Bay Area was a big part of their nest egg. Now, it's a big part of the problem. They bought the house in 2005 at the height of the real estate bubble in California. I probably have 50% of what I need uh, to retire comfortably, not in this house, but in, a, in a, a little more modest house. Cost of living in this area is pretty expensive. Our electric bill in the summer is around $600 a month. Can you pass some napkins, please? Yeah. We just cut back on magazine subscriptions and cable and um, very, just whatever little ways we could think of not eating out. This is the one that we've got to pay or they're yeah. going to be upset with us. Yeah. It's a little frightening, and we could lose everything, but not right now, but we could lose more and more of the savings as we're trying not to lose everything else. Okay. Oh, Bobby, oh here we go. For Bob, simply turning 65 will help ease some of the financial stress of not having a job. Thank you. <laughs> he will officially be on Medicare as of his birthday. That's a really good thing for us right now. He doesn't have any insurance. Um, he hasn't had for quite a while. He had COBRA for several months, and I don't know if you know about COBRA, but it's pretty pricey. So he finally just gave it up, and he said, I just, I won't have an accident or I won't get sick. Julia knows all too well the financial gamble he took with his health. Four years ago, when Julia was 66, she and Bob received an unexpected blow. Um, I was diagnosed with um, anal cancer on December 28th, 2009. That happened to be our 28th wedding anniversary. <laughs> this is the day we got married. Yep. I got up one morning and immediately fell on the floor. Her white blood cell count went to zero. Ooh. Oh, this one, wow. <laughs> and Bob bundled me into the car, took me over to the hospital. So they put her into an isolation room, fed her full of antibiotics. And my sweet son, Jeff, had shaved his head in solidarity. I spent eight or 10 days in the hospital. And there was an eight hour corridor which I could have lost her. And so when she did make it, it was, it was a celebration. Yeah, and every day since then is a celebration. Ready? Go get it. A celebration thanks goes. largely to her Medicare coverage. <laughs> we wouldn't have been able to have the scans and the, all of the medical things done to me that were so crucial to keeping me alive. Where did Louie go? Bob calls me um, the $2 million woman. Come on, let's go, come on. That's right, $2 million in medical expenses picked up by Good Medicare. Boy, but it was the uncovered additional expenses that began to chip away at the couple's nest egg. There was the $100, the $400, the $300 for extra things and things that weren't covered. That added up to thousands of dollars and that was, that was a hard hit too. One night I snuck a Captain Jack Sparrow into the room and put it up above her bed. And so when she woke up, it was staring down at her. <laughs> Living longer adds another wrinkle to the American retirement picture, an increasing number of years to stretch a retirement budget. Oh, and my hair coming off, wow. Your hair cutter still talks about it. 65-year-old couple walking into my office today has a 50% chance one of them will live to 92, and there's a 25% chance one of them will live to 97. So um, that's 30 years of Social Security payments indexed for inflation. That's not what the system was built to support. Lift and wherever that takes you. All these wonderful you developments in healthcare to extend our longevity too, is making um, right that lifetime payment much, much more expensive to uh, fund. 
Even as the American workforce lives longer and extends its reliance on retirement benefits, another demographic shift only makes the problem worse. Americans are having fewer children, which brings us back to the structural integrity of Social Security. A shrinking number of new workers are paying into a Social Security system, benefiting more and more retirees. Hey, John. Hi, John. The lopsided reality of Social Security is often a spirited subject of discussion for Julia and her Gen X son, John. He says, you baby boomers, you're taking all the money. Um, you know, there's so many of us that he thinks that we're going to deplete Social Security, which is probably right. And I said, I can't help it when I was born. You know, that's, that's, this is my time, and I need Social Security, especially now. But G. Larducci says the system was designed to handle shifting demographic stresses. Well, it turns out we've always known that the ratio of workers to retirees were going to, um, to get lower. Count them to the 14. Oh, I have to throw one out, right? <laughs> Social Security administrators knew that, that people were going to live longer and that the baby boom generation was huge and that the generation coming behind them was small. So those numbers weren't hard to, um, to calculate. To the Social Security critics, G. Larducci says the real problem is not as simple as too few current workers paying for too many beneficiaries, but a sluggish economy and unsustainable cost of health care. It's been the low rates of pay for the average worker, the high cost of health insurance, which means money going there doesn't um, get taxed and put into the Social Security system, and these really persistent periods of unemployment. And it's a long bout of unemployment that's got Bob where he is today. Now the question is, just how long can he afford what's turned into a forced retirement? This whole thing has been very humbling to me. It's, it's made me really aware that people can get into situations where they feel helpless. Thank you. You're welcome. I appreciate it. Happy birthday. Thank you. How did this happen and why? Um, we're not the only ones, though. It's happening all over the place. Overall, completely happy with my choice of career. But um, I really wish I made more money. <laughs> we don't make enough money. Show me the money. Jean Gilbert makes $23,050 a year. Her salary as a cellist with the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra. Anyway, we could do it one last time. She supplements her income by teaching cello lessons. Pretty good. And that all went a lot further when she wasn't the sole breadwinner and a single mom. Ow, you but you gotta get all the tangles out or I'm gonna have to do it. I've gotten divorced. It will be final in a matter of about four days from now. You go put some shoes on it, okay? I have a three-year-old daughter and now I am once again a single person living on my earnings and child support. Facing divorce, suddenly, was not planning it, has definitely, you know, rocked my whole world and forced me to think much more about money. She did much more than think. She made a detailed budget, accounting for every conceivable dime in income and expense until she's 80. I'll just let the viewer imagine all the sort of concomitant, concomitant, is that a word? Stuff that goes along with a divorce that falls in your lap suddenly. Okay, I'll just let the viewer imagine. Now I have a line item for hair, but my hair doesn't grow very fast, and so I only get it cut once every three months. Factored into Jean's master budget is the promise of a $1,000 a month pension from the American Federation of Musicians. 
but Jean's pension is in trouble. Like many pension plans, the collapse of the financial markets in 2008 led to the plan's, quote, worst investment losses in its 50-year history. And then I discovered recently the pension fund itself is in so much flux. It's in some kind of restructuring or something. I don't know. In fact, her pension plan is now in critical status after the investments made didn't hit the expected 7.5% in returns. Instead, the plan's value actually declined by 40%, or $900 million. You're a two-drink kind of girl. You should have not get me two drinks. For better or worse, I am banking on my pension existing, continuing to exist, and benefiting me when I retire. <laughs> I'm very much hoping and counting on that. I don't know how it will happen. I don't know how I will retire, but I intend to one day. Jean's anxiety is shared by countless Americans. For nearly 20 million local and state employees in particular, underfunded pensions aren't just making their own futures uncertain. They're threatening the very solvency of cities and states across the country. If recently bankrupt Detroit gets the headlines, the 300,000 citizens of Stockton, California know all too well the pain of the Motor City. Before Detroit, Stockton was the largest municipality to declare bankruptcy in 2012. We are now pretty much the poster city of what not to be. We are in the top 10. We're in the top 10 most miserable city list. We're in the top 10 of the highest foreclosure list. We're in the top 10 of the highest unemployment list. We're in the top 10 of the highest violent crime list. Paying off pensions and lifetime retiree health care benefits have clearly played a major role in keeping Stockton on those undesirable lists. Stockton, like a number of other cities in this country, took on large obligations that they didn't fund. They took on debt in order to build some new facilities downtown, but they also made very big promises to employees, mostly for health care and for pensions, that they didn't put enough money away for. A lot of municipalities are facing bankruptcy. The same reason that a lot of homeowners are finding that they're underwater in their homes that they could have never afford. Wall Street firms gave them a blank check and said, hey, you have an unlimited credit line, go and spend it. Yeah, but it's always been home. We're approaching right now something I'm not a fan of, which is the Stockton Marina. Not because I'm against people with yachts, but we have a community with 20% unemployment, 30% poverty, record homicide rates, 86% of your kids aren't reading at grade level. There's other things you could use public money for than a marina for yachts. Who in Stockton has a yacht? I don't know anybody with a yacht. Maybe I need new friends. 23-year-old Michael Tubbs isn't necessarily interested in making new friends. He's interested in making a difference. Yeah, yeah. I just don't think there are priorities for a community with all these other pressing issues. It's like putting lipstick on a pig almost. That's why the recent Stanford University graduate returned home to the bankrupt city of Stockton, where, at 22, he became the youngest councilman in the city's history. Councilmember Tubbs. Happily here. And while he's happy to serve the city he calls home, he isn't happy about the problems Stockton faces. The recession, the mortgage meltdown, spending, 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 then we issued bonds, and those bonds were tied to our general fund, and the projections were, we're gonna keep growing at five to 10% every year for the next 20 years, and it didn't happen. All that came crumbling down at the same time. Crumbling down for Stockton meant drastic reductions in essential city services. So before bankruptcy, the city just cut, cut, cut. Um, we cut police and fire by 20% for three straight years, or something very close to that. We went to a the lowest officers per capita for a city this size in the nation. Cities have services that they provide to their citizens. Most of their money goes to police and fire and employee compensation and benefits. And they make promises for future payments to those people. 
At the same time, they've got obligations that they're providing to those, their, their citizens. When they're unable to meet both obligations, they start to cut back on current services rather than on those retirement benefits or the debt service. So if we had declared bankruptcy, you would see trash everywhere. But we declared bankruptcy to save the bare minimum services we had at that point. I think you're doing a great job, and this is opinions. But the bare minimum doesn't sit too well with the citizens of we Stockton. Right we got robbers coming from the Bay Area to come and steal here in Stockton. Say there's no cops there. How long is this going to continue? How do you fight crime if you have nothing for these children to do out here? Right. My kids sit in the house. You took the water slide down, put a shopping center. You took the skating ring and made it in shape bigger. What do you have out here for these kids to do other than statistics of crime? Maybe this person is a really hard worker. Maybe this person has a hard life. Maybe for Michael, one way of keeping the kids from becoming well, statistics, like his own cousin who was murdered, is to encourage a love of learning. Well, we're going to read through our notes and figure out where the themes are of the biography were. you were right. Which is why the part-time councilman is also a full-time teacher. Pack up. <laughs> Graham Stockton definitely had his challenges. There was times my mom wouldn't let me go outside and play. There was churches, I played basketball, there was a lot of summer activities. A lot of those things I've been scaled back or cut. These issues that most affect our families and friends were homicides, incarceration, and school dropouts. We're still paying <laughs> on it. Taking on Stockton's on future means having to make some difficult decisions for Stockton's present, like eliminating retiree health care. It's a cruel outcome. So you have employees in Stockton. The employee goes on into retirement. The payments start to be made a bit. And then all of a sudden, Stockton declares bankruptcy and eliminates retiree health care. And those employees who had counted on those premiums being paid by the city are out cold at that moment. Still, the city of Stockton has refused to touch pensions. Well, pensions are important because people dedicate a lot of their working hours of life to their job. And in my opinion, a good society doesn't get rid of people once they're done being of productive use because they're retired. I have a meeting with the city manager. There has to be some sort of reform of the pension system. We want to make sure it's available, not just for this generation, but the generation after that. My generation, the generation after that. Tonight, you are going to vote on an increase in our sales tax. But saving pensions means the money has to be found elsewhere such as a tax increase that would push sales taxes to 9%, among the highest in the country. Council members, you represent a community that has one of the highest poverty rates in the nation. You know that this tax will affect your communities and they have no way to absorb it. And many states, like cities, are on the brink of a pension-fueled fiscal disaster. Pensions can be a wonderful way for people to have retirement security. The, the problem is not pensions in and of themselves, it's the governance of those plans. And good governance requires good math, but many pension funds have relied on bad math, projecting high investment returns that simply don't match up with a more volatile reality. So Shakespeare said, first shoot the lawyers. What he should have said is first shoot the actuaries and the accountants because they have been used, really manipulated uh, the accounting for pensions uh, at the state and local level so that we have lots of unfunded pensions. This is really a, a, a crime, a sin. You know, you have people who put their lives at risk, you promise them a retirement and then you're reneging on that. I mean, that is immoral. So they couldn't retire? What happened to them? Well, let's see. The first little pig was uninsured and had used up most of his savings on medical expenses. His social security checks were a crucial part of his Florida dream. But it was 2033 and social security was in as bad a shape as he was. His benefits were suddenly cut by 
And a note explained that the almost insolvent system meant future payments were uncertain. Meanwhile, the second pig had just learned that his city pension plan was underfunded. The city had recently negotiated with its employees to give them only half of what he had been counting on, just like in Rhode Island. But the third pig was okay, right? He was the smartest one. The third pig had done everything he thought he was supposed to do. He had contributed regularly and generously to his 401k. I knew it. Unfortunately, the economy in the Enchanted Forest had taken a nasty downturn when the elf cookie market tanked. Saw that coming. His 401k was worth a lot less than last time he had checked. And even bricks might not be enough to stop the wolf this time. <laughs> It's not gonna fall over anymore. It's not gonna fall over? Well, no, if we build it the right way, it won't fall over. <laughs> <laughs> not so many years ago, Aaron and his wife Debbie were confident they were building their future the right way. Yeah! Like that? Sure. <laughs> but today, those plans have been derailed by an onslaught of setbacks. Pumpkin. Did you see that one? And the dice are supposed to stand on it. It's hard to believe this bouncy, happy three-year-old has a congenital heart defect. Do you want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, Cece? No, no, I'm not hungry. <laughs> and it was hard for Debbie Kinkella to believe when she first heard the news seven months into her much-anticipated pregnancy. I cried for like two months every night. I just cried myself to sleep. It was an odd time in my life because that was right when I had gotten laid off. This was the first time that we held CC. While Debbie was grateful for the time off to focus on the birth of CC, losing the income from Debbie's job couldn't have come at a worse time as medical expenses would begin to pile up. I figure the year CC was born, we were probably into it for between eighteen and twenty thousand dollars just for healthcare premiums. <laughs> you know, Debbie, put your shoes on. Here you go. Aaron works in the IT department for a Seattle-based cookware company. He has a good benefits package, but CeCe's medical needs still take a good piece of his paycheck. Put your foot in there. I would love to say that my health care costs were a couple hundred bucks a month and then put the rest of it in our 401k, and I can only imagine what my 401k would look like at that point. But, you know, pretty close to 20% of my income goes to paying my health care expenses. Going to school, sweetie. And even before CeCe's high health care costs, Somebody's Aaron and Debbie's retirement planning had taken a huge hit. Did you see that? <laughs> Literally 12 days before we got married, we had to move out of our house due to the fact that it was most of the house was underwater. <laughs> the supply line on the upstairs toilet had, had popped off the had popped off the toilet and it ran for what we figure pretty close to four days. So we moved out, renovated the upstairs, and then <laughs> still five or six years later, I'm still renovating the home. The busted supply line was just the beginning to their unexpected losses. Next was the bursting of the real estate bubble, taking with it half the value of their $300,000 Seattle home. Part that scares me about the home is really what it does to our long-term financial future. Paying the mortgage isn't a problem. It's, it's how do you recover from being $150,000 in the hole when one of the biggest assets in your retirement years is the equity in your home. Life happens. People should save because there are things that happen to you that you can't expect to, um, to plan for. Your old self needs your young self's money. Want day to carry you? Come here, pumpkin. And the younger you are, saving for your old self, you don't have to sacrifice that, um, that much. Now it's off to work. <laughs> but Debbie and Aaron were saving. Tens of thousands in savings, and not many people can, can say that. In fact, this is a family who's played by the rules. Well, Mike and I were talking about that account. Debbie now juggles two part-time jobs. 
Okay, great, thank you. They drive 12-year-old cars. He contributes regularly to his 401k, and they have a sizable amount in savings. But still, they're unable to imagine ever retiring. You know, previous generations were able to, to accomplish that. You know, you know my neighbor, he, he got equity in his home, a substantial amount. I, you know, um, he's got a pension. We, we used to think in terms of these three equal things, pensions, social security, personal savings. That's the sort of three legs, if you will, of our future retirement. There's all these social structures that we've relied on in the past, but the reality is it doesn't look that way anymore. Pensions, you know, this idea of working in a company for 30 years and retiring, you know, we're on sort of the last generation of that. One of the last generations so, retiring uh, with know, the like, guaranteed steady income of a pension like for life. That's not a very good stool. But even for generations past, retiring with a pension was not quite as common nor as reliable as we've come to believe. We have a bit of a mythology in our thinking about the private pension system. Mark Avery is a senior advisor to the U.S. Treasury Secretary on retirement policy. We tend sometimes to idealize what it used to be like. And many of the people who had those defined benefit plans have gotten wonderful benefits from them. But many have also gotten relatively smaller benefits because they did not stay with the employer long enough. And pensions are even less the norm today. Things are not as stable. The company's willingness to make a 40, 50, 60 year commitment to its employees was something much more thinkable back in the 1950s, the post-war period, than it is in today's much more rapidly changing world and much more competitive economy. So employers are simply not as willing to enter into those kinds of very long-term financial commitments. Since the 1980s, employers have increasingly shed pension plans in favor of the 401k plans that shift the risk and responsibility of retirement planning to the employee. The employee in recent times has to take more of the initiative. And that message that if you're relying mostly on the 401k, you ought to be contributing, if you can, something like double digits, not three or four percent of pay. Now, employees must decide not only if they'll save for the future, but also how they'll save. In the 401k, you have to decide typically how to invest among a menu of alternatives. Now that can work perfectly well, and the individual choice is a good thing. On the other hand, many people over the years have made choices that may not be so wise. Many retirement industry professionals say giving individuals the choice to save is working. When someone is covered by a 401k or similar savings program at work, they're more than 10 times likely to actually save than someone who doesn't have an option at work and their only option is really to figure it out on their own into an individual retirement account. The percentage of people who can save in an IRA are individual retirement accounts who actually do so is something like one out of 10 or less. Whereas in a 401k, the percentage of people who could save who actually do so is more like three quarters, two thirds, three quarters, traditionally. But the 401k saving system hasn't worked for everyone. Half of American workers don't have access to a 401k plan. And those who do have the option don't always take advantage of it. The system that we put in place 30 years ago is a failed experiment. We instituted a, a retirement plan that was a do-it-yourself model. It relied on people making decisions every paycheck about how much to save, where to put that money, and then when to take it out. Should they take it out to buy a new house, to put a kid through school? Those were decisions that are very hard for human beings to make. Why? Because human beings have very pressing needs. And of course, we always got that balancing act between you know, living today, right, the present, and 
planning for the future. And the moment we start planning for the future, that involves all these sort of right, fears, concerns, uncertainties, all that stuff that's not really fun. One thing's for certain, Debbie and Aaron are worried about today and tomorrow. I mean, we're just sort of maintaining, uh, which is okay. I mean, at least we're able to, you know, pay our bills. To me, that's not enough. I don't want to just cover the expenses. I want to be able to also save for the future. Oh, good job. You know, I mean, we're both working. We should be able to do that. It seems odd that we were not. So the whole happily ever after thing was a lie? I've been duped. The thing about happily ever afters is they don't just happen and they don't always happen the way we want. We have to be flexible. Pigs aren't flexible. They're fat and have short legs. Maybe so, but these pigs didn't give up. For starters, the first two sold their homes and moved in with the third. By pooling expenses, they could really stretch their money. And the third pig sold his RV to little Bo Peep. So, so the wolf went away? Well, they weren't out of the woods yet. The problem is, is the more we kick the can, so to speak, the uglier the solutions have to become. The more you delay, the fewer options we have, and the fewer lead time people have to prepare themselves for changes that are inevitable. Mm -hmm. And so we should stop fooling ourselves or being dishonest with your generation and get on with fixing this stuff. Mm -hmm. Everything you care about, yep. your entire future, it could be messed up by these people in Washington. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, I'm glad to see you here, but I'm more encouraged to see that you're out in the country talking to people. Nick's fight for the financial future of his generation has brought him to Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Just one stop in his nationwide campaign to inspire his fellow millennials to demand that their voices be heard. So I just wanted to take you through some thoughts that I've had about why our generation stands to lose the most, how our American dream is in peril. The possibility of a secure retirement is among the losses facing Nick's generation. And those deficits add up to our whole debt. And as For them, that final act of the American dream will likely follow a much different script. It's going to get worse. I think we're going to have to be more self-reliant and also more creative about, well, what does work mean? after the age of 65. So I think we're gonna be working longer and we're gonna to have to be relying on ourselves a lot more to provide the kind of uh, life we want in our older age. I think it's really important that we get our hands dirty and go into this budget exercise. Thank you so much, Nick, I appreciate it. Congratulations, uh, you've just become members of Congress. And but just as the group was about to play a polarized charged Congress. With ways, charged with finding ways to reduce, whoa. whoa. <laughs> Roaming blackouts. The lights on campus went dark. Back at the Beardsleys, a dark California night is the beginning of a major change. Oh, wow, you made it! <laughs> the reality is, in 2005, it was at the top of the market. So we bought high, and of course everything has gone down, and we are underwater. Uh, the house has lost, on paper, uh, almost half of its value. Please hurry up. Oh. <laughs> Ew, this mm. is painful. On top of that, Bob is at the end of his self-imposed deadline to find work. Um, mm. Unemployed for more than a year and with a house they can't afford to stay in, a change is inevitable. I'm not emotionally ready to walk away from this house or anything like that. It's financially stupid to do so. If it's financially stupid to walk away, it's financially impossible to stay without Bob finding a job. <laughs> oh, great to have you guys here. But turns out 
there's another option. Welcome. Welcome home. Julia's son, John, his wife, and their three young sons have made an unexpected move west from New Jersey and in with Julia and Bob. You want to see your bedroom? We haven't put the sheets on yet. Oh, it's fine. This is your mom and dad's room. So look at your bedroom. And then I more and then realize the... You little monkeys. I'm really over the top. I'm so happy. I've never had my adult children live in the same area that we live. So I've not grown up with my grandkids. It's just so exciting. Grandkids are fun. Shake it, shake it, huh? It's a temporary fix, a one-year arrangement, until John and his family can find a place of their own. But with another income to help pay the bills, Bob and Julia are finally feeling a sense of relief. Poor guys. We're trying to help each other, so they're just paying a small portion of what they consider rent and we consider mortgage, half the groceries, and uh, sharing the utilities. A year of shared expenses will also help John as he settles into his new job and begins to rebuild his family's financial security. Are you in debt? Yes. How much? Who isn't? That is none of your business. If you win like a million dollars on a game show. Uh, it doesn't work that way. I wouldn't count on game shows as a form of income. I think if I could have rewound 10 years prior and said, would you have expected to live with your parents at age 46? I'd say no. But is it unusual? I think in this country it might be. When you look globally, I don't know that it is. I actually think it's a very nice thing. Are they going to cure me or kill me? The kids? You know? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm making a Spanish paella. You like it, huh? You pour it in very carefully, OK? Oh, oh, I can do bacon waffles. <gasps> oh! <laughs> Put it on. <laughs> you guys are fun. Three generations of family under one roof breathes new life into Bob and Julia's retirement years, an added benefit that can't be measured in dollars and cents. Hey, guys. <laughs> Julia. Spot for you. Clean. Clean. Had all the well, pot of me. Time is, at, at the end of one's life is one of the most precious commodities. Oh, that was nice. Bobby. Out of nowhere. It's not renewable. You can never get it back if you lose it. And everyone needs it, just like they need food and water. With time scarce, finding ways to make retirement more secure is imperative. One thing experts agree on is this. America has got to get back to saving, which is no simple task. We've got a country that's not saving anymore. We've produced a big increase in consumption, a big decline in national saving. Our national saving rate is now 1%. It used to be 15%. We have to figure out how to put guardrails or automate good behavior. Because if left to our own devices, we're all about you know now. And there's something really positive about being present now. But if we're going to make any change, we also have to be thinking about the future. Turning America's retirement prospects around is the chief responsibility of Mark Avery, the country's likely architect for retirement savings of the future. We can make it easier still for people to save and thereby get many more of our fellow citizens on a path to having adequate retirement security. Right now, we're not on that path. Too many people are just not saving enough, and that's partly because so many people are not in the employer system that we now have. Every solution? Automatic enrollment in individual retirement accounts, or auto IRAs. This approach requires employers without retirement plans, but with more than 10 employees, to direct a portion of each paycheck into an IRA. Employees could still opt out. And it looks like we could really create a breakthrough in retirement savings coverage if we automatically enrolled tens of millions of employees who are working for employers not yet willing to sponsor a plan. Auto enrollment, he says, has already proven itself in the 401k system. We use automatic enrollment in the 401ks 
we find that the percentage of people who are not participating drops from something like a quarter to a third down to maybe 5%. And so we get a tremendous boost in participation, particularly among people who are least likely to be saving otherwise, which include minorities, uh, lower paid people, uh, and women as well. It's that most vulnerable segment of the population that worries economist Teresa Gilarducci. She says part of the answer lies in raising the tax cap for Social Security deductions. Right now, everybody pays up to $110,000 and some change. It goes up every year according to inflation. So there are a handful of highly paid folks that actually stop paying tax by the summer or by the fall. The very wealthiest, the very highest earners on Wall Street, Bill Gates, they stop paying Social Security tax like halfway through January. Another proposal found in the Social Security trustee's own report, a 2.66% increase in the payroll tax split equally between employees and employers. That alone would keep the system fully funded for the next 75 years. But the forever fix would take a 4% tax hike, a 2% split between employees and employers. At some point, the system will run out of money. We're either going to have to raise taxes or cut benefits by even more than 22%. This system is totally broke. Or will be. The fixes themselves are hotly debated. Raise the retirement age, refigure cost of living adjustments. What economists do agree on is this. Delay is not an option. What's going to happen here is that the politicians are going to continue to do too little too late. They're like operating on a patient with cancer. He's got a very big tumor. They say, oh, we're going to take a little bit of it out now, and uh, we'll come back in a couple of years and operate some more. A couple years later, the patient's got an even bigger tumor. And at some point, this process leads the patient to die. The ideas are out there, the good policy is out there, what's missing is the political will. And we as young people need to do a better job and show up and say, cut the BS. The students gathered in the darkness at Emory University have done more than just show up. The power stayed out the entire night, uh, but we banded together, we figured out a solution and moved classrooms and the event went on. We can't tweet or Facebook this problem away. They've hunkered down, determined to talk about solutions under the glow of emergency lighting. So it is a really emotional issue, but you can understand why, because those programs are really important to people. A lot of this, like, restructuring. And I think it's a testament to the ability of people in my generation not to stand around and bicker, but to solve the problem. You can go to dozens of events when you're a college student. I guarantee you no one's going to forget the day when the power went out. Thanks, guys. It's been great to be with you all tonight. I hope they left with a sense that we are the solution. We're not waiting for someone else to drop down from Washington with a policy plan. The answer is going to come from us and through our activism. Like Nick, plenty of Americans have grown skeptical about what they see as mere political hot air from Washington. You can't solve big problems with what fits on a bumper sticker. But if the solution won't be as simple as a slogan, it better be soon. Otherwise... Maybe you should just give up the notion that you get to retire. Change what you do. Incoming. You're welcome. The first pig started working part-time to earn a little extra money. The second pig was saving money by not hiring a contractor for the improvements the trio thought the house needed. The third pig stayed on at his job for a few years longer than he had planned, hoping that the economy and his 401k would turn around. So maybe they did live happily ever after. Maybe they did. But that's where the pig story leaves off. What? But I want to know. Why don't you start thinking about your own story? What story? <gasps> what? <laughs> that story.
story. Hello everybody, my name is Chad Parks. I am the executive producer of Broken Eggs Film. You've seen the stories, but it doesn't end here. Everyone needs to get involved in order for us to avoid the looming retirement crisis. That's why we've created a platform for your voice to be heard at brokeneggsfilm.com. Join the community and share your story. Text the word retire to 411-247 to get a link and more information. This problem can be solved. Be part of the solution. Our young people have got no future. They've got no future. They'll never ever be able to really own anything. <laughs> I think the moral of the story for our generation is find a job you love because you're probably gonna end up doing it till you're 80. Are you guys there? Okay. I, I won't move. Whoa. Now I'm going to sing for you. <laughs> that story is starting to sound a little like Smeagol there, dude. My precious. What did you do? Lightning bolt. Bam. Mom! Okay. Mom! Okay, and not to be silly, but do you want me to, like, kiss my hand just to make it authentic? <laughs> not awkward at all. May I have about two moments? I'll be right back. They try to tell us and at times we try to listen But we can't hear a thing when all we think about are all the things we think we might be uh, half retarded You are correct <laughs> Gold star for you It could be boring as hell, you know, after two or three years of retirement And you're looking forward to another 20 years oh, What are you gonna do? This is national delusion of grandeur. It's like, look, man, I gotta be super famous and rich as hell, or I don't know what I'll do. So I don't know if that's a commentary on our generation right there, but. So you're supposed to save the most for retirement when you're the youngest, and that really scares me. Retirement keeps me up at night. I'm gonna write this down. First time client said, if you feel like squealing, <laughs> now it's a stuck pig, sorry. Life is short, so at that age, if you still have to do a job just to make money, it's it's so stupid. I feel like that's a waste, and you're not fulfilling the end of your life. You're not fulfilling what you want to do, and if you're about to die, whoever knows when, why not be happy? You know what I mean? Nobody's perfect, gray hair ain't a crown of wisdom But you're a young man, so you're an old man The real key is, is not to create a system that forces people to put their money into the system so that they can get something out of it, but to teach people what they can be doing. If you give a man a fish, right, then he can eat for a day, but if you teach a man to fish, then he can eat for the rest of his life. We need to have an adult conversation in this country around the issue of what does retirement mean? Thank you guys. It's been fun. It's a great project. I'm excited to see the finish.